So, do you want to hear a story? Well, I have a story for you. This story comes from North Wales. If you know it, you might find the little town of Bala. And next to the little town of Bala, you will find Bala Lake, as it's known in English. But as we all know, it should really be called Llyntegid. Llyntegid is a beautiful place. It is a wide, flat expanse of crystal clear water where you can go canoeing or, or boating, fishing, I dare say, or just walk among the trees and the grasses or up the hillsides and look down on it all from up on the tops. And it is a beautiful, beautiful place. But it was not always so. The story tells us that once upon a time you would not have found a lake there. No, you'd have found a wide open valley with a mound and on that mound was a fortress. And this fortress was built and ruled over by an absolute tyrant. An absolute despot of a local lordling who extended his grasp across all the hills and valleys thereabouts and made sure that everybody who lived there knew that he was in charge. And the taxes were high, but you didn't get very little for your money. No, no, all the ordinary farming folk thereabouts were just left to get on with things for themselves. Nobody looking out for them, except for when him and all his lordly mates liked to come riding roughshod all the way through the fields and across the farmlands on the hunt or on their way to some tawny somewhere. And if you were an ordinary farming person who got in their way, then woe betide you because their hooves of their horses were heavy and sharp and their swords were sharp and heavy also. But the worst part of it was that this lord kept on inviting all his friends and cronies to join him in the fortress there for a party. They had parties upon parties upon parties galore. And there was feasting and drinking and carousing and all of this, all of this had to be provided for by the common folk, bringing in extra taxes and extra goods for all the Lord and his cronies to sit there enjoying. But there was one particular party. There was one particular party. When they decided they needed some entertainment as well, and as it happened, there was a poor wandering harpist walking through the area. And when news of him and his songs and his playing reached the ears of the Lord, well, he wasted no time. He sent out soldiers with their heavy, sharp-hoofed horses and their sharp and heavy swords to round up, round up the harpist, bring him to the fortress so he would, he would entertain the feast. And so the harpist found himself there at this particular party playing his songs, singing his music in the corner of the hall and watching as the Lord and his cronies played their party games and downed whole horns of mead and stuffed their faces with haunches of roast hog and oh, nobody paid him the blindest bit of notice. But when he finished, when he climbed down from his stool, and he asked one of the servants who were bustling about working so hard if they knew anywhere that he could sleep for the night. And the first servant he spoke to said, oh, I haven't got any time for this. I've got to get the lords their food. And he watched as this servant went and, and laughed to all the lords' jokes and, and kept feeding them more and more roast hog and refilling their horns with mead and, and, and giving them every sign of absolute obeisance. So he went and asked another servant. And this servant said, I don't care, I'm not having any of this any longer anyway. I won't stick being treated like this. I'm off and tried to leave. But then he saw the guards come and catch that servant by the collar with their heavy metal mitts, drag them off to a side room for God knows 
what punishment? So then he thought he'd best just go and find somebody else. And he found somebody else who was looking as harassed and as worn out as all the other servants. But she said to him, well, you know, I don't think they've really thought about that, I'm afraid. But there's some space under a bench there with some straw. You could go and lie down there, try and get some rest. So, well, he did. And he went and lay down and he watched all the servants bustling about. And every now and then someone would chuck him a crust which he could chew on. And he tried to block out the noise of the lords and their mead and their roast hog. But then he heard a noise, a sweet tinkling noise, a magical musical noise, a sparkling, twittering song. It was a little bird, a little brown speckled bird that had come and lighted down on the, on the flagstones in front of the bench where he was resting. And this bird hopped about and fixed him with a with a shiny, beady eye and sang more of its beautiful, sparkling, golden song. He'd never heard the like of it before, and so he, he crept out from under his bench to, to look closer and listen more. The bird hopped a few paces away, but kept looking at him, kept fixing him with its beady eye and kept singing its song, so he, he crept a bit further tried to get closer and the bird waited until he got a bit closer and then hopped a few paces away and kept looking at him, kept singing its song. And he didn't know what was going on, but he kept following that bird until he realised it was leading him out of the hall and through the gardens and out of the walls of the fortress and off across the fields. And then he saw that all around him, in ones and twos, there were some of the servants too, the ones who'd been dragged off and bruised and beaten by the guards and, and, and the ones who'd taken pity on him and shown him where to sleep and thrown him crusts. They were all following this bird as it sang its beautiful, sparkling golden song up across the valley, through the grasses and trees and up onto the tops of the hills. But but by that time, by that time it was nightfall and it was pitch black and they could hear the birds singing all around them but they couldn't see it anymore and they couldn't see where to put their feet, how to find their way back home again. So, well, they just about found each other in the pitch black and they all agreed that maybe the best thing to do would be to just stick together, hunker down, try and make it through the night, all of them as one, and then see how things looked in the morning. So that's what they did. But they didn't get much rest. It wasn't because of the cold, no, it wasn't because of that, it wasn't because of the damp either, or even though this was a North Walian night, no. It was because all around them, from every corner of the heavens, they heard a cacophony, a clamour, a tumultuous noise, an uproar. And from down below in the valley, answering this, they heard rushing and roaring and foaming and fermenting and crashing of waves. They did not know what was going on. They stayed there, curled up and quivering all night long. But when the first light of the dawn appeared in the east, they got up and they stretched and they rubbed their eyes and blearily looked down and they couldn't see the valley below them, no. And they couldn't see the mound and they couldn't see the fortress either because that tyrant and all his lordly friends had been swept away, swallowed up, absolutely inundated in a flood that left nothing but the beautiful, crystal clear, still waters of the lake that you'll see there today. And that is the end of the story.